I really believe that the legacy of the junk wax era continues. And I really think that the junk wax era collectors are going to make a big impact on sports cards in the near future, in the immediate future. It doesn't matter if you're a vintage collector. Vintage collectors need to be aware of the impact of the junk wax collectors as much as modern card collectors. Now, it really, to me, is irrelevant if you are trying to go full Willy Wonka and pull a golden ticket from a Wonka bar in an immaculate box in a National Treasures box because you're a modern collector. Or if you're somebody who collects cards from the 60s and 70s or even before that. The junk wax era created a ton of collectors. And those collectors are going to be making an impact on new cards and old cards for the next 20 years. Watch this video and see what I mean. But the Junk Wax era legacy will continue to live on and continue to impact both modern cards and vintage cards. Check this out and tell me what you think about it. So the junk wax era, the number of collectors that started really getting into the hobby in the late 1980s and early 1990s was astronomical. You could go to Costco and buy pallets of cards in boxes for like five bucks a piece. There were chase cards then like there are now. I remember in 1987 or so, it was Jose Canseco's Rated Rookie, and then the Maguire Tops and the Maguire Rated Rookie. And one year after another, there was a new card that everybody was after, depending on if it was the MVP candidate or the Rookie of the Year candidate. But we really got into cards. And I say we because I really started collecting myself in about 1987. And year after year, there was a chase card. There were packs we were ripping. Even if it was a Todd Van Poppel or an Ivan Rodriguez, we were way into cards. And then we hit our teens and we hit our early 20s, and a lot of people started stepping away from their sport card collection. But if you look at the players we were really watching when we were kids, it was the Nolan Ryans, the Cal Rickens, the Wade Boggs, Kirby Puckett, Bo Jackson, Don Mattingly, Andre Dawson, Mike Schmidt, Ozzy Smith, Ryan Sandberg, it was Tony Gwynn. These were the guys that the, were the perennial all-stars. These were the superstars. And when we were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, we couldn't afford, in many cases, their cards. We wanted them. We wanted the 84 Flair Update Kirby Pocket. We wanted an Andre Dawson rookie card. If you go back about five years before that to the 1984 All-Star Game roster, we've got George Brett, Rod Carew, Reggie Jackson, Jim Rice, Alan Trammell, Dave Winfield, Eddie Murray, Ricky Henderson, Phil Necro, Cal Ripken, Don Mattingly. That's just the American League. The National League, Gary Carter, Steve Garvey, Mike Schmidt. Ozzy Smith, I mean, these names, Dale Murphy, these are the names that were the superstars. And while we were opening packs of 89 Donruss, we still wanted a Ryan Sandberg rookie. We still wanted a Cal Ripken rookie, but we couldn't afford them because we were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old. But what happened was... We were way into the superstar. We were way into sports cards, but we were buying what we could afford. 
So if you look at the players I just listed from 84 to 89 that were the superstars, these were their cards. These were their rookie cards. Dwight Gooden and Ozzy Smith and Mark McGuire and Ricky Henderson and Alan Trammell and Ryan Sandberg and Cal Ripken. And these were the cards that we all wanted, but we couldn't afford them. We couldn't afford those cards, but we wanted them. And, you know, COVID did change things. COVID changed things in that we were starting to look at our own mortality. We were starting to look through our closets at all the stuff that we had stacked up because we couldn't leave our houses. And we said, man, I'm getting old. I want to feel young again. I want to look at my baseball cards. And then the government started sending checks in the mail to lots of people. And when they were sending that money, we had some money to spend. Now, if you were born in 1975, that means you're now 47, 48 years old. Your kids are in their mid-teens, maybe late teens. You were 10 to 15 years old during the junk wax era. If you were born in 1980, you're now 42 to 43. Your kids are mid-teens, maybe late teens. You were 5 to 10 years old during the junk wax era, and you were collecting cards like crazy as a kid. Well, guess what? Your income is starting to peak and your kids are older and your free time is peaking. And so what a lot of people do when they're in their mid to late 40s is they want to start to relive their childhood. Now we look at this chart and this lists out what your median income is by age. 35 to 44 year olds, it's 90 grand. 45 to 54, it's almost $100,000. That's the age of the people that were the junk wax collectors right now. Their income is peaking. Their free time is peaking. They're back into cards because of COVID. And guess what? They want to buy those cards they could not afford when they were a kid. They want to buy the Cal Ripkins. They want to buy the Tony Gwynns. They want to buy the Rod Carews and the Dave Winfields and the Gary Carters and the Jim Rices. And so for a long time, the cards from the 70s and 80s have not had a huge demand. But I think that demand is going to go up because guess what? We look at the cards from the late 60s and early 70s Those are the vintage cards of our generation. I think those cards are going to be going up soon.